start the recording. Oh, somebody's already started it. Perfect. Um, so my name is Karen Grant. I am Director of Admissions for the Medical Degree Programmes here at Lancaster. Thank you for putting your year groups into the chat so I can see that most of you are year 12. So today I'm going to talk about um, a few things that we thought might have been affected for you guys in terms of the coronavirus global pandemic. So I'm going to start off talking about your personal statement and what you, how to make your personal statement as strong as possible, what you can do. And because it's kind of related to what you'll write about in your personal statement, I'm also going to talk about work experience and um, kind of acknowledge some of the challenges in terms of getting work experience at the moment. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about preparing for interviews. So you guys are mostly year 12 by the looks of things. Um, so preparing for interview might feel like it's quite far away, but we'll go over kind of what sorts of things you need to think about about preparing for interview um, anyway, because it kind of leads on from personal statement and work experience. They're, they're kind of uh, of a piece. They're all, all related. Now, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I'll also stop at various points and see whether we've got any questions. So I might not answer your question straight away. If you post your question in the chat, I might wait till I get to the end of a section and then stop and then answer questions that have been posted in the chat. Um, and at the very end, I'm happy to take questions about anything. So you might have some questions that occur to you about what I'm saying as I'm talking. Feel free to post them in the chat. If you just have general questions that you want answered, we can leave them till the end if that would be OK. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at the end. OK. So can everyone hear me all right? Anyone? Everyone can hear me? Don't, no problems going on? Hopefully, if you had problems, you would be posting in the chat for me. So let's move on to personal statements. So before we start about talking about personal statements per se, I thought we might start off with thinking about what medical schools are looking for from applicants. So they're looking for a combination of academic aptitude and sort of non-academic skills, values and attributes. So for the academic aptitude, medical schools look at the GCSE grades you've achieved, they look at the predicted A-level grades or IB grades that you're predicted to achieve, and they also use uh, the admission test scores, so either UCAT or BMAT, they'll look at those scores and those are trying to look at whether you've got kind of academic sort of thinking, critical thinking skills that you need um, to be a successful medical student and future doctor. And then in terms of the non-academic skills, values and attributes, do that in a number of ways. So um, they'll look at what you've written in your personal statement, they'll look for some of those skills, values and attributes that they're looking for, and we'll cover that in a few slides time. Some uh, medical schools will ask you to fill in a supplementary information sheet, um, and that's because they're looking for very specific information that they find applicants don't always cover in their personal statements, so they might ask you for um, some supplementary information. And then if you're successful at getting to interview, then that kind of assessment of your skills, values and attributes, that's done at interview as well. So there's a bit of an overlap between what's done looking at your personal statement or that supplementary information and what is um, assessed when you come for interview. So if we think about the personal statement first, so as I said before, it's kind of looking at non-academic skills, values and attributes. So there's each medical school kind of looks for slightly different things. And we'll cover, I'll give you a couple of examples in a couple of slides time. But in general, they're looking for why do you want to be a doctor? What have you done to find out about this potential career? How do you know you're going to be suited to that career? What 
skills have you developed either at school through extracurricular activities or through work and voluntary experience um, that you think are relevant to being a doctor in the future? How do you know whether those skills, why do you know that those skills are relevant? How have you developed that understanding? So those are the kinds of things that they're looking for in your personal statement. And as I say, I'm going to cover a couple of different medical schools and what they're looking for specifically. The other thing that um, we tend to be looking for is that you have an appreciation and an understanding of the NHS core values. So again, I'm going to cover those core values um, in another slide, but you can just Google them and find out some information about what those NHS core values are. And the reason why we want to know that you understand them is that the NHS is like everything the NHS does is underpinned by a set of shared core values and so it's important that a you understand them b that you kind of buy into them because you're going to be trained within the NHS and most of you will work within the NHS. So we're looking for you to have um to find out what those core values are and apply to them to what you've already learned about a career in medicine. One thing that might come as a surprise to you is that fewer and fewer medical schools really use your personal statement um, in a strong way in their selection process. They don't, they, fewer medical schools are using them to decide who they might call for interviews. Some still do, but fewer are using it in that way. But they might. Um, use the personal statement when you come for interviews. So if you come for a multiple mini interview, for instance, which we'll talk about later, there might be one of the, the MMI stations where you are asked to discuss your personal statement. So they might use it at interview, even if they haven't used it as part of their selection process to decide who gets to interview. And the other thing is, even if you, if, even if they don't do that, actually preparing your personal statement, reflecting on what you've learned about, about your chosen career, sort of writing it, crafting it, will have forced you to think about some of the things uh, that, you, that will be picked up at interview. So actually by preparing your personal statement, it's helping you to prepare for interview. So even if it's not used, it's still a valuable exercise to, to go into. So I said before that there's, there's quite a lot of overlap between what medical schools are looking for from a personal statement, but um, they are not exactly the same. And so when you come to write a personal statement, and especially if the medical schools to whom you're applying are using it as part of their selection criteria, then you need to check that your personal statement addresses the requirements of your chosen medical school. You need to do a bit of homework. Normally it's um, that information is freely available on the medical school's website. They'll tell you about how they select students and they'll tell you the kinds of criteria that they're going to apply. So um, I'm going to in the next slide I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of different medical schools and the attributes that they're looking for in your personal statement. But before we cover that, I'm just going to kind of quickly run through what those NHS core values are. So the first one is called working together for patients. So that's about teamwork and collaboration and acknowledging that within healthcare, it's there's lots of multidisciplinary working where doctors are working alongside um, nurses, other healthcare practitioners, social work workers, all sorts of different people who contribute to the care of patients. The next uh, criterion is our core value is commitment to quality of care. So that's kind of showing that you want to make sure that the care that's delivered is the very best care that a patient could ever get. So in terms of a doctor, that's about making sure that your knowledge and skills are up to date. Um, but it's also about making sure that you would recognise when care wasn't optimal and do something about it. The next one is compassion. So this is just about treating your patients with care and compassion and, and thinking of them as individuals rather than just a kind of collection of interesting signs and symptoms that you might want to diagnose. Improving lives is about improving health. 
Um, and a lot of healthcare is moving away from there's something wrong with your patient, you treat them, they get better and, and you never see them again. And it's much more about how to prevent patients from becoming ill in the first instance by improving their health. And, and doctors and all healthcare practitioners are, are, are playing a greater role in improving health rather than um, treating ill health. Everyone counts. So that's about equality and inclusion and making sure that none of your systems sort of discriminate against particular um, elements of your patient group, that everybody um, is treated fairly. And the final thing is respect and dignity. So that's about how you treat your patient. It's, it's, it's related to compassion, but there are different elements to consider when you think about respect and dignity rather than treating your patient with compassion. So those are the NHS core values and what's expected of you is not just that you can memorise what these core values are, but that when you're thinking about what you've learnt about medicine as a profession, that you can identify parts of your personal experience, that you can relate to these core values, that you can think about how you might have seen healthcare practitioners embodying these core values when you when either you've been a patient yourself or you've been on work or voluntary experience um, how you might have seen how healthcare practitioners uh, embody these and 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 demonstrate these core values in their practice so it's something a bit more complicated than just saying yep i've heard of the core values and this is what they are that we're looking for it's about you to reflect back on your work or voluntary experience and talk about how what you've learned about these core values. So I said before that medical schools, um, what they're looking for from personal statements is often quite similar, but they will maybe talk about sort of um, delineate what they're looking for in slightly different ways. So here I've given you two examples: Leeds Medical School and Manchester Medical School, and what they're websites tell you that they're looking for from um, your personal statement. So at Leeds, they want you to demonstrate insight into a career in medicine. So that is really about what have you done to find out about a career in medicine? What do you know about a career in medicine? And it's about making sure that you understand the realities of what a career in medicine will be like. Evidence that you can take on responsibility. So that could be in lots of different um, forums evidence of social and cultural awareness now that plays into those core values in terms of everyone counts and respect and dignity where it's sort of you have to be able to show that you're aware that there is lots of things which influence health that are not um, directly related to what you might be able to do in terms of diagnosis or treatment of of a patient's condition and then interest activities and achievement so that's looking about things that you've done extracurricularly, how have you balanced your time with your studies, what skills might you have you have developed through those. So that's what Leeds are looking for. Manchester are looking for experience in a caring role. So that's really about um, you know, demonstrating that you uh, can cope with uh, sort of with interacting with vulnerable others while you're in a, a, a caring role hobbies and interests, so that's kind of related to the interest, activities and achievements that leads are looking for. Team working, so it's very it's very core to a sort of healthcare practice at, um, at, in the current times. So again, that would feed into your insight into a career for medicine and then motivation for medicine, but again, it's like, why do you want to be a doctor? What do you know about your career? So you can see that there's quite a lot of overlap, but the stipulate it in slightly different ways. When you write your personal statement, you need to look at the four medical schools you're applying to. Do they use the personal statement in their selection process? What are they looking for in your personal statement? And make sure that your personal statement is crafted to cover those, those uh, issues. The next I'm going to talk about work experience and volunteering, because often you would write about these in your personal statement. But before we move on to that, does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? I'll just leave a minute or so in case anyone wants to type a question into the chat. So 
Okay, doesn't look like we've got some questions, so we'll move on. So next, as I said, um, I'm going to talk about work experience and volunteering now, because this is often um, constitutes quite a large proportion of what people write about in their personal statements, because this is how they demonstrate what they've done to, de to decide that medicine's the right career for them, and it's how they might demonstrate that they've got the skills and values and attributes that we're looking for, and it's how they might um, kind of sort of talk about what they've learned about medicine as a career. So medical schools want you to do some relevant work experience because it's important that you do understand um, the realities of working in healthcare so that you can make an informed decision about whether medicine is the right career for you. The worst sort of outcome really is that you get into medical school because you're interested in certain aspects of medicine but when you start to do your clinical placements you realise that you're not suited to the way that healthcare functions or works that you find it very challenging being in an environment when you're interacting with vulnerable patients who are old or very poorly or young or vulnerable in other ways. So the point in work experience is for you to develop a better understanding of your chosen career and to be able to really make an informed decision as to whether this is the right career for you. A lot of um, sort of volunteering experiences will also help you to develop relevant skills. So you need a little bit of insight into what the skills are um, that you need to be a successful doctor, um, to be able to write in your personal statement about what skills you've developed. And so this is where there's a kind of overlap between doing work and voluntary experience and your personal statement. So a lot of people, I guess, work and voluntary experience falls into two camps. So one might be working with people in a caring or service role. So examples of that might be volunteering in a hospital, volunteering in a residential care home, volunteering um, in an after school club where you're looking after children, volunteering um, maybe to sort of to be part of a club that helps um, people who have either learning difficulties or physical disabilities and help them to kind of achieve their goals. So there's lots of ways in which you can work with people in a caring or service role. And then the other thing that the applicants can do in, in advance of applying to medical school is direct observation of, of, of healthcare. So that's the shadowing. It's, it's arranging a placement where you shadow a doctor and see what they do for a living, see what they do in their day to day uh, work. And um, I think applicants think that what we really want is for you to do direct observation of healthcare. And I think what medical schools would prefer is that you did the working with people in a caring or service role. So sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch between what applicants think we're looking for and what we think we're, we're looking for. Um, the work experience can you can make um, it can be a, a work experience shadowing placement um, that might be arranged through your school or you might be able to arrange um, yourself. It can be a volunteering placement like in a hospital, in a residential care home, all of those things, or it could be paid work. So you might work in a shop or you might work um, as a healthcare assistant or you might work um, in a fast food restaurant. Uh, there's all sorts of ways, places where you could work, that you could draw upon those experiences to demonstrate that you've developed relevant skills for being a doctor in the future. And I think um, I would encourage you to, to do that, to use all of your experiences to date to try and reflect back on what do you know about being a doctor, what do you know about the skills that are required, and what do you know about whether or not you develop those skills. So I think there are some myths. There are some myths that you must shadow a doctor and if you haven't shadowed a doctor you're not going to get into medical school. That's not true. We recognise that it's very difficult to get some shadowing with a doctor, especially during COVID. 
Um, I think if you can get any experience in a caring or a healthcare environment, that's really useful just because it will give you an understanding, a better understanding of the kind of stresses and strains of working in healthcare. I, I think people think that if they have more, lots more uh, experiences. So if they've shadowed four different doctors and been to GP surgery and worked in a pharmacy and done more things, that that's better. Well, it might be, but it's not necessarily better. Doing more things and just writing in your personal statement that you've done these things is not actually what we're looking for. And I think it's also a kind of preconception that um, if you do a much longer placement, that that's better. So again, it might be if you've learned a lot more because you've had more experience, but if you've just had a long experience and haven't really engaged with that experience and haven't really learned, learned very much about it, then that's not necessarily a better thing. Really, if I could give you one take home message is that what you've learned from whatever experiences you've got is much more important than what you've done. So try to get work experience, try to get volunteering experience, make the most of what you have, but really pay attention to whatever it is that you do and try to maximise what you learn from those experiences. Um, and there are some hints and tips about how you do that. I think whenever you do have any experiences, then you try to record it quickly about what it was like and very important to kind of reflect back on what you learned anything that was unusual anything that was unexpected anything that you think might be relevant to those core values we talked about record those straight away jot it down in some kind of reflective diary so that when you come to write your personal statement or when you come to comfort interview you've got those notes to kind of refresh your memory about what you've already learned about about your chosen career Volunteering in a care setting is often easier to organise than shadowing a doctor, especially during COVID, getting into a, a clinical environment is, is challenging at the moment, but you still might be able to volunteer in other kinds of settings that will give you some kind of experience. And as I said before, it's absolutely fine to use paid employment, A, when you're writing your personal statements and B, when you're at interview, when you're asked to reflect on something, it's absolutely OK to use paid employment if you have it. So obviously, COVID-19 has um, made it extremely challenging for applicants to get work experience. And um, the Medical Schools Council have produced some guidance to help applicants. And I've got some links on my last slide, which um, we can share with you. And I recommend that you go and have a look at that guidance. They've kind of given some, uh, some examples of what you could do um, to develop the same skills and insight that medical schools are looking for without being able to actually have work experience in a clinical environment. So they've suggested that you could keep a reflective diary about the pandemic. And I've got another slide which maybe can get you to think about different aspects of the pandemic that you could think about that are relevant to, to medicine. There are quite a lot of healthcare practitioners who have been blogging about their experiencing of experiences of working during the pandemic. So you could you could read those, you could reflect on what you've learned. And again, there might be some things that you've learned there that are unexpected or things which um, are less than ideal, but you might want to reflect on what you think about those and how does that influence your thoughts about going into medicine as a, as a career. On the Medical Schools Council website, there's also links to two kind of um, online resources that you can use. Um, so one is something called Observe GP, and it's a, a series of video interactions between a GP and a patient. So it's a, it's a bit like shadowing a GP, but it's by watching videos. So again, you could watch those videos, you could make some notes, you could think about what you've learned about core values, about the skills the doctor demonstrates in that, in that video. And by doing that, you're still developing some of the skills and insight that we would have expected you to develop by doing a, 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 
an in-person face-to-face shadowing placement. And then Brighton Sussex Medi- Medical School has put together a whole package of um, different online resources called the Virtual Work Experience. And again, the link to that is available through the Medical Schools Council website, which I'll give you at the end. So there's a couple of things that you could do. If you can't get any work experience or even volunteering experience in a healthcare setting, you could use those. And they're good ways of kind of getting some of the understanding that you would have got from face-to-face interactions. And although it might be quite challenging to get into the NHS to do any volunteering at the moment, there might well be non-NHS volunteering opportunities that are available. And by doing that, you're kind of demonstrating manage your time with your studies, that you can you probably will develop skills in terms of communication or team working or working in challenging environments, which you will be able to um, apply to to the sort of um, the context of medicine if you were invited for an interview or again in your personal statement uh, before you apply. So it's interesting, I think COVID-19 as a pandemic has obviously given us lots of challenges. But it's like a little, it's like a little for, for medical educators, it's it's an exemplar of all the different ways in which we have to think about um, caring for our patients. So in, in Lancaster, our curriculum is, is split into four themes that cover slightly different topics. Medical sciences is kind of what you expect. It's the biology of how the body works and how it goes wrong in disease. Health, culture and society is things about your patient that influence whether or not they're healthy, but are not directly related to the medical science. So that might be, for instance, what socioeconomic group they're in. Those in lower socioeconomic group groups have far poorer health than those in higher socioeconomic groups. The reasons for that are really complicated. Population health is where we look at public health, epidemiology, medical statistics, all sorts of things which are relevant to COVID. And finally, the final kind of curriculum theme is professional practice, values and ethics. So that's our four curriculum themes. And in on this slide, I've kind of highlighted um, sort of different things which come up in the news about COVID that are related to those four themes. So in terms of medical sciences, we've been thinking about what do we know about the roots of infection of COVID? Is it, does it float in the air? Does it land on surfaces? How do people catch it? And then we've been thinking about the pathophysiology, the effect of COVID on the lungs. Why does it cause the, the particularly acute respiratory distress syndrome that it does when other coronaviruses don't? And then in terms of the new treatments that have been used to treat COVID, 19 patients, some of it is using very old and established drugs like dexamethasone. And then there is other kind of newer treatments which are being trialed to see whether they are being effective. And again, you could could, find information about that uh, online and you could look at that and sort of explore that. In terms of health, culture and society, you could be looking at the differential effects of COVID on patients, depending on what socioeconomic group they're they're from, what ethnic background they're from. And there's quite a lot has been published in the press about that. You could be thinking about what influences the public perception of risk. Um, So although we have all these safety procedures, there are definitely some people who are not complying with all of the safety precautions that the government is advising. Why is that? You would think that they would be worried about catching COVID or passing it on to their loved ones. So there's something there about how people perceive risk. Under population health, there's loads of stuff that's related to to our population health theme. So there's the role of Public Health England in controlling the pandemic. All the data about tracking and tracing cases and all the numbers that we've been looking at about how many cases are there, are they going up, are they going down, how many deaths have there been, there's been stuff in the news about different ways of of defining COVID-related deaths, which has changed over the course of the pandemic. Uh, And then the other thing that I think COVID is really good at kind of getting people to think about is the fact that there's an emerging evidence base coming out. At the very beginning, we knew nothing. 
and scientists and epidemiologists have been working really hard on um, learning more about coronavirus. And that might get you to think about what study designs are appropriate. How are we, what's the evidence that's out? How do we appraise that evidence when we have two bits of evidence that might not agree with each other? So all sorts of really interesting things about thinking about medicine and what you would have to think about in medical school arise from, from the pandemic. And finally, professional practice values and ethics here, I've kind of thought, well, in the very height of the first lockdown, in the very first wave of the pandemic, there was a shortage of, of ICU beds, there was a shortage of ventilators, and doctors were having to make really difficult decisions about who was going to get care. And so here you're thinking about how do doctors make those very difficult decisions? What kind of what kind of factors will they take into account? How do they make the best possible decisions under these really trying and challenging times? So if you were to try and think about all of these different things and look at what's published in the newspapers, published online, uh, you could learn a lot about what you're going to be studying at medical school, but through the context of the pandemic. So the pandemic has maybe taken away lots of things that you would have been able to do normally, but it's given you these other opportunities to learn in advance of starting to study medicine. So that's the bit about work experience. Again, I'm going to stop now and see if anyone has any questions about personal statements or work experience before we move on to interviews. So someone's asked, is it too late to start a COVID diary uh, or would you recommend we go back and recall what has happened? So uh, it's never too late to start a COVID diary. I think we're about to enter into uh, a new phase of the pandemic with the vaccinations and with maybe mass testing. Um, so I, I wouldn't go back unless you have very strong memories of what you felt at the time. I would just do it from now. What's happening at the moment? How are things changing? How are things reported in the press? What does that make you think? So then the next person has says, when we have work experiences, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Could you try uh, rephrasing or you could unmute your mic and ask me a question? So someone's asked, are we able to use online sessions like this or taster lessons with universities to put into our reflective logs? So you can, um, Monica, but I don't think that they're the best way to um, explain what you've learned. I think it's better to engage with something a bit more direct and then reflect on what, what you've learned. So if you were to go to a blog about um, a healthcare practitioner's experience of, of, of delivering healthcare during the pandemic, you could reflect on that directly. And that would be a much more useful thing to do than talking about having spoken to me. Does that make sense? It's better to kind of be as close as it can be to healthcare pra practice rather than talking about having spoken to somebody who's tried to push you towards some of those resources. So Issa Zafar, or Zafar Issa, I'm not sure which, which, how, which way around your names are. I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you want to um, unmute and ask me your question? Or have another go at typing it in the chat? So someone's asked, what length of time is recommended for volunteering? So, as I said before, it's really not about uh, length. It's about um, what you can learn from an experience. Now, the longer you do, if you were to do a volunteering placement with in a, a residential care home, for instance, then if you do it for longer, you're going to learn more about how how to interact with vulnerable people. You're going to be given more responsibilities and you're going to be able to be more embedded within the team and learn a lot more. 
So I don't think there's a recommended time. I think you need to do it until you feel as if you've learned what you could have learned. You've also got to think about it from the perspective of the, say, the residential care home. They have to go through quite a few hoops to kind of get you prepared to go and volunteer with them. So if you went through all those hoops and went through sort of uh, clearance and all of that, and they trained you, and then you only went for a couple of weeks, it's really not very fair on them to expect you to do that. So you might think about giving back. If they've trained you and given you the opportunity to get some experience that you might want to give back so that you um, are learning more about, about that particular context, but you're also kind of giving back to them because they've given you the experience. Uh, so then someone says online courses and MOOCs are helpful for applying for medicine. So I think they're helpful in terms of teaching you more about them. Um, so again, it's about learning more about your, your career. I think um, so all of these things are valuable you need to maybe make sure that you've got a variety. You're not just learning about medical sciences because often when you come for interview, we don't really ask you about your understanding of the science because we, we use your A-level grades to assess whether you've got a good scientific mind. So we're, we're often looking for the kind of non-science stuff. So it's good to use a MOOC if, or an online course that's of interest to you, but try to make sure that you've covered some of the non-science side of medicine in some of your MOOCs. Next person has said, does your work experience have to be with medicine or can you have work experience from other areas too? So it absolutely doesn't have to just be with medicine. It could be with, it could be in a care setting. It could be with other healthcare practitioners. It can be paid work experience. So you could work in a shop, you could work in a fast food restaurant, you could work um, in a swimming pool, all sorts of things that you could do that you could use as your work experience. What you're trying to do is build up a picture of what do you know about the, the sort of challenges of working in medicine or at working in healthcare? What skills do you have you learned that you need and what skills have you developed and how can you demonstrate that you've developed them? And so you can use lots of different bits to feed into how you would do that. So the next person says, where can you record and show your work experience, volunteering, reading, etc.? Are you able to submit a log as it may be difficult to condense them all down into a personal statement? So I, so I, I think you need to record your work experience for your benefit and reflect on what you've learned. The personal statement, it doesn't matter if you don't cover everything. What you probably want to think about and for your personal statement is, A, what medical schools are you applying to and what are they looking for? And then what are the core messages you want to get on? So into your personal statements, what's the most important thing you've learned about, about medicine as a career? What's the most important thing you've learned about the skills that a doctor ha needs? What Skills can you demonstrate from your work, from your work or extracurricular activities and boil it down to what's the core messages you want to get across rather than trying to fit absolutely everything in that you've done. OK, we've had quite a few questions there. So if you've got any other questions, feel free to post them. Um, in the interim, I'm going to start talking about preparing for interview. And as I said before, for me, your work experience, your personal statement and preparing for interview are kind of a continuum. You do the work experience to learn about the career. Your personal statement is asking you to kind of write about what you've learned about the career, about yourself and about the skills that you think are required. And then the interview is is when we you we speak to you face to face and we kind of explore some of those same um, areas about what you've learned about about yourself and the career. So I always start with thinking about why do we bother to interview applicants? Obviously, it's very it's very expensive and time consuming to interview applicants. And so there must be a reason why we do it. So. The first purpose of an interview is to discover whether applicants are suited to your particular medical degree programme. Um, 
there's lots of different medical schools across across the UK. You come out with the exact same qualification regardless of where you study, but they all deliver their medical education in slightly different ways. And so they want you to have thought about whether you're suited to the way that they deliver their medical education at that particular medical school. So often within an interview, that will be part of the questioning about why have you applied to this medical school? What do you already know about our medical degree programme? Oh, pardon me. So the thing you need to do is do your homework. You need to go onto the website, find out about the course structure, go to open days if they're running, find out more about how, um, what's the kind of key features of that particular medical course, find out about the course structure. And then you really need to think about whether, what is it about this, the way that they deliver their course that appeals to you. So you need to think about it. And I would always encourage you to choose your medical courses like the courses that you apply to based on whether you are suited to the way that they deliver medical education. I'm not sure that applicants always think quite as rationally as that, but that's what I would encourage you to think about. Have a look at how they deliver medical education, think about how you learn, and then try to kind of then think through for yourself, what is it about this course that appeals to me? What are the factors, what are the elements of the way that they deliver medical education that really appeals to me? So the other thing that the medical interview is trying to do is determine whether we think that medicine is the right career for you. And that's done by assessing whether you've got the right skills, values and attributes that are going to make a good doctor. So for that, you need to be looking up what those NHS core values are. You need to be reflecting back on your personal work and voluntary experiences. To, uh, and and sort of again using the core values as part of that reflection what have you learned about those core values from your personal work and voluntary experiences and then you need to be thinking about uh, so I've observed healthcare practitioners delivering care what what if I thought that they were good at their job what was it that they were doing that made them good at their job what skills do you need to be good at uh, um as a healthcare practitioner. And then do I have those skills? If I have those skills, how have I required, how have I um, developed those skills? Is it through my extracurricular activities? Is it through my Saturday job? Is it through my work or voluntary experiences? So it's about thinking about what those skills are and then thinking about whether you have them and how you might demonstrate them. So this is the sorts of things that you need to think about in advance when you're going for interview. There's two different flavours of interview that are used in medical courses. So there's a traditional panel interview. So that's the, the diagram on the top left hand side where you've got one applicant who's being asked questions by three or four different interviewers. That is, um, is used by fewer and fewer medical schools. Um, more and more medical schools have moved over using something called multiple mini interviews. So instead of having one long interview with a panel of interviewers, you will have lots of short interviews with, um, with maybe just one person. And each of those interviews with the, the one person counts as an independent assessment of your suitability for medicine, looking at particular skills um, and then you're looking at your performance across the board to see whether you're um, into medical school. I haven't gone into massive amount of detail here about this, but if anyone has questions about those two different formats of interview, we can cover that at the end. So um, this year, um, because of the ongoing pandemic, quite a lot of interviews are going to be online. Uh, I think it's likely that actually that every, all interviews will be online this year. Now, most of you said you were in year 12, so by the time you get to interview in a year's time, fingers crossed, the pandemic might have settled down and we might be able to invite you to, to come for a face-to-face -face interview. But I thought it might be interesting to think about what we've done in response to the pandemic in terms of interviews. So if, if it hasn't calmed down and you're invited to an online or virtual interview, there's a few things you need to think about in advance. 
do you have a suitable quiet space to conduct the interview? You know, do you have somewhere where you can close the door and be sort of private and your rest of your family won't stumble in? Do you have suitable equipment like a laptop or an iPad that you can use for your interview? Do you have good enough broadband and internet connectivity? Because um, that can really um, impair your ability to communicate if you're if the internet connection keeps going down. Um, and one thing that we have suggested for applicants this year is if at home they don't have a quiet space, they don't have suitable equipment or they don't have good broadband or internet con connectivity, could they arrange to do their, uh, inter their online interview at school or college where they, they might be able to provide you with a private room, they might be able to provide you with a laptop or a computer so that you can do your interview somewhere um, suitable. Um, lots of different medical schools are using lots of different platforms. So we used uh, Microsoft Teams. So we used this platform to do some interviews earlier on this year. Some have used Zoom, some have used other kind of platforms that's part of their virtual learning environment at that medical school. And then there are some um, medical schools where they basically did um, asynchronous interviews. So they sent applicants uh, a list of interview questions applicants had to record their responses and then upload them and then the interviewer assessed their responses um, sort of separately. So again, Medical Schools Council have thought quite carefully about uh, what applicants might need to know if they're being invited to an online interview and they've produced some guidance which is on their website and again I'll give you the links to that at the end. <coughs> so if you're preparing for an interview, I think there are a few things that you can do to help yourself. So um, it's good if you can arrange for somebody you don't know very well to ask you some questions. It doesn't, I would say, it doesn't really matter what questions they ask you. Um, it's more about sort of ask, answering a question that you don't know what it's going to be in advance, posed to you by somebody you don't know, where you have to build up a rapport with them very quickly. You have to think about what your answer is, compose your answer and respond within a kind of short space of time. These are skills that you need for every interview. And sometimes it can be uh, to applicants' detriments if they try to predict what the questions are going to be. Because often if they've predicted what the questions are going to be, you'll create a little pre-prepared spiel about your work experience or about what you think the most important attribute a doctor must have, those kind of things. But the problem is at interview, those pre-prepared, rehearsed answers don't come across very well. And the other thing that can be difficult is if you've prepared a, an answer to a question and then the interviewer actually asks you a question that's not the same question, but it seems to you that it's, it's close enough, Applicants often try to give an answer that they've not really answered the question. It's 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 close enough, but it's not really answering the question. And again, that doesn't that doesn't tend to do very well, and you're not likely to be successful. So, it's okay to think about what you might be asked to interview. It's okay to practice answering questions, but try not to be too hung up on what those questions might be. You have to be able to turn up, listen to the questions that are asked think and respond in the moment rather than sort of being too reliant upon pre-prepared answers. There are a couple of different types of questions that are quite commonly used and so these are called behavioural and situational. So a behavioural type question might be can you tell me about a time when you behaved in a particular way? So it might be can you tell me about a time when you had to work in a team? Can you tell me in about a time when you had to communicate something that was really difficult? Those are the sorts of questions that they might ask you. Whereas a situational question might be, imagine you're in this situation, how would you behave? Or how do you think you would behave? So it might be you come across, you meet your neighbour outside, you, an elderly neighbour outside and they seem very confused. What would you do under that situation? So those are common types of questions that, that might, they might ask you. And again, they're, 
if you always remember, what am I trying to demonstrate here? I'm trying to demonstrate that I'm suited to being a doctor. So what have I learned about the skills that a doctor needs to have? How might I demonstrate them in my answer to this question? The other thing to expect is that, that your answer will be challenged often. So if you make an answer, they might say, oh, that's interesting. You said that you would behave like this. Why would you not behave like that? Or um, what would be, what was the, what was the, why did you behave in this particular way? So that doesn't mean to say that you've got the wrong answer. It's just about them exploring a little bit more about why you have said what you've said in your answer. So expect to be challenged. Don't be don't be put off if, a, if an interviewer does that, because that's just to explore a bit more of your answer. So as I said before, you do your work and voluntary experience or you do the kind of online things that we've talked about. You reflect about what you've learned about a doctor, the skills you need to be a doctor and what skills you might have. If you do that in advance, then you'll be able to draw upon that those reflections when people ask you questions. Doesn't mean to say you have to have a pre-prepared answer. It's just being able to have thought about it in advance and be able to go, oh, I can think of an example because I've thought about this. And the other thing that's often useful to do is to keep abreast of topical medical and ethical issues that are in the news. So this is where COVID might be a good a good way to do this. If you keep up to date with what is being said about COVID, what are the issues, what are the challenges, what are the things that people don't agree about about, about COVID. So, you know, we've got a vaccine coming out, but we've got some people who are vehemently opposed to vaccination. So you could be thinking about what the different perspectives are there and what you think about those different perspectives, about people who are advocates for vaccination versus people who are anti are, are opposed to vaccination. So those are sorts of things that you can do in advance so that when you come to interview, you're prepared to answer any question that they might ask you. So we've talked about looking at the NHS constitution and core values. We've talked about that a few times. So I think that's a really good place to start. It's a good place for you to start in year 12 before you really do any of that work and voluntary experience or even the online stuff, because then you've got that framework about what you should be trying to learn more about. We've talked about using COVID. It's a really good uh, exemplar for all the different branches of or aspects about medicine. There are a whole bunch of podcasts out there that you can uh, use that helps you to learn more about medicine. So there's Inside Health, Inside the Ethics Committee. They're both available through the BBC and Sounds. And then there's uh, my favourite podcast, which is called This Podcast Will Kill You. It started off looking at different infectious diseases, so it started off looking at plague and things. Um, but then more recently, it's covered things like lead poisoning, things like more environmental uh, aspects of health. This podcast will kill you covers the science, but it also covers the kind of epidemiology, the kind of social factors which influence health and influence how people respond. So those are really useful. They're in, they should be interesting because you want to go into a career in medicine. So finding out more about what the different aspects of medicine should be interesting to you. You then are more informed. You know more about it. So again, that helps you when you come to interview and what might be asked about you. And then the thing that you should always be thinking is, what do you think about these issues? What do you think about what's being presented? Um, and that will really help you to develop that kind of critical thinking, reflective practice that will help you when you come to interview. So someone's asked, when, where can we find that last podcast? So uh, I access it through Spotify. Um, I'm sure there are other ways that you can access podcasts. Um, if you just Google it, this podcast will kill you. You'll find it's got it's all over social media and it's got its own web page. So I'm sure you'll be able to find it somewhere. But I get it through Spotify. I'm sure that maybe I shouldn't be recommending a particular podcast um, provider. So tips for interview is quite a long way in advance for you guys. I understand that. So but these are my top tips. When you're asked a question, listen carefully to the question. You'd be amazed how many times applicants just don't answer the question they've been asked. It's OK to think before you give an answer. So I, I have a rule of three when I'm being interviewed. 
take up to three seconds to think about your answer and say no more than three things. And that stops you rambling. So trying to think about a concise answer where you say no more than three things. Try to sit with an open posture. So it's about that good, open, relaxed, non-verbal communication. Everyone knows that you're going to be nervous when you come for an interview, but if you can be as relaxed as possible, that comes across well. You want to be making eye contact because that's, a, that's again, it's a, a non-verbal communication skill that helps you to develop a rapport with your interviewer. Be prepared to debate your opinion. So expect to be challenged, expect them to ask you questions. Don't expect them to just accept your answer. Be enthusiastic. You'd be amazed how far being enthusiastic about your chosen career will go. If you can talk about, about why you want to be a doctor, about what you've learned about it and about why you're just so enthusiastic about going into this career, it goes a long way. And then the last thing is just try to remain as calm as possible. Um, so everybody knows you're going to be really nervous. But obviously in medicine, you need to deal with quite challenging and harassing circumstances all the time. So if you can demonstrate that you can remain calm, even although you're in a stressful situation, again, A, it helps you give good answers, but B, it comes across well and it comes across as if you're able to, you would, you would be able to cope with the challenges of, of studying medicine and being a doctor. So the last thing I said I would give you is all of these web links. Now, what I might do is copy all of these web links into the chat uh, later, or we can get these slides sent to you if that's possible so that you can then uh, check it out. If you can't get these links, then all you need to do is Google Medical Schools Council. And then when you get to that, you can see there's different bits. There's a bit about studying medicine and there's so much information there. There's information about the different medical schools, their entry requirements, there's stuff about preparing your personal statement, uh, about work experience, about online interviews. There's so much information there that's not specific for one particular medical school. It's like applicable to all of them. So it's a really good source of information for applicants. That is me finished with what I have to say. Um, and now I'm happy to take any questions that you have about anything I've said this evening or anything else that you want to know about. I might not know the answer, but I'll, I can try and answer. So someone has asked, how does the new health innovation campus used in the course offer at Lancaster? So the medical school is now based in Health Innovation 1. So it's a brand new building that um, it opened, it was finished during lockdown. And we now have moved into that, uh, into that building. It's got a curve purpose-built anatomy teaching suite. It's got a purpose-built clinical skills teaching suite. Um, we have problem-based learning rooms. We have a, a lecture theatre. Um, it's also got a big cafe and lots of self-study space for students. Um, all the staff are going to be based in Health, in health Innovation 1. Um, so yeah, it's, it's now going to be the home of Lancaster Medical School. So Monica has asked, will this recording be available to us? That's my understanding, Monica. Um, I think Nicola is on the call. Nicola, do you want to answer that question? Hi, yeah. Hi, Monica. It will be um, available to you. I'll pop in the email address that you'll need to email um, in order to receive the recording. So it will be ready next week, but I'll pop the email address in the chat now. So I think um, if anyone wants the recording or a copy of these slides, then if you email the the uh, address that Nicola is going to put in the chat, then we can make sure that that's sent to you and then you can have that available to you. Does anyone have any other questions? It can be about anything about medicine, anything you like. No, no more questions. Well, in that case, oh, we do have one more. Oh. OK, so how much emphasis is put on GCSE grades at Lancaster? So um, we we have some minimums. So you have to be take well, we take eight GCSEs, your best eight GCSEs, but those best eight have to include 
biology, chemistry and physics or core and additional science and maths and English. And all of those have to be grade six or a grade B at minimum. And then we have a kind of scoring system. Um, and the reason why we do that is because those with better grades at GCSE are more likely to achieve the grades that we're looking for at A level. So that's why we, we do use GCSEs at, as part of the academic entry requirements. So then someone's asked, how do we talk about courses we did in interviews? So it would be in relation to questions that are asked Zainab, where somebody might ask you something and then it might not even be that you talk about the courses. It's more about you might be able to answer their question based on having done courses. So it's not really about you saying I've done this course. That's that's fine. It's more that you'll be able to talk with authority and answer the questions you might be asked to interview, drawing on what you've learned from the courses. Does that make sense? And so Nicola has posted the email address, which is schools at lancaster.ac.uk. So someone's asked, can you expand upon the multiple mini interviews? I can. Um, so multiple mini interviews, uh, either what will happen is you'll have different interviewers in maybe a, a, a kind of corridor of different rooms. So you go into the different rooms and you might have five minutes or 10 minutes or seven minutes in each with each of those interviewers and each of those interviewers will ask you a different set of questions each of the kind of mini interviews are trying to assess slightly different skills so some might be looking at your communication skills some might be looking at your understanding of core values some might be looking at um, your ability to interpret data you know there's all sorts of things that might be included in a, in a multiple mini interview but because you're assessed by lots of different people, each of the assessments is kind of independent of each other. Whereas in a panel interview, if you don't answer one set of questions well, it tends to colour everybody's impression of, of all of your answers. So the multiple mini interview, it's kind of you've got independent opportunities to impress. And generally, you're going to be assessed by maybe six, eight, ten different people. And you'll get a score for each of those stations. Every medical school will kind of use those scores slightly differently but all it means is that you've got multiple different interactions with an interviewer that's really all that that the multiple mini interviews mean medical school if you're invited to interview should give you a bit of information um, about what to expect sometimes there's some information on their website as well so Ms. Buzz asked if you don't know which uni you're deciding on is it recommended to take the UCAT and the BMAT so Ms. Bob, what I would do is I would uh, go on to the website for UCAT and BMAT and I would have a go. There are practice papers for both, both of those tests. Have a go, see how well you can perform and that might help you to shape, to decide whether you've got a good chance at a UCAT school or a good chance at a BMAT school. I wouldn't think about just saying, all right, I don't know where to go, so I'll do both. You can do UCAT in the summer and then BMAT doesn't, you don't tend to take it until November. So you've the two are split apart. So you can kind of do UCAT, get your score, and then if you don't get a good UCAT score, you could reconsider and maybe think about BMAT score, BMAT uh, medical school. It's more important that you think about whether the medical schools are the right place for you to study rather than whether the admissions test is the right thing for you to do. But it's definitely a good idea to go on and have a go at the practice papers, see how good you are at the two different sort of admissions tests, and that might help you to decide. So then Toby's asked, do you know when the applications for the access to medicine course for Lancaster will open? I don't, Toby, but we can try and find out for you. So again, if you were to email the email address that Nicola posted, the schools at lancaster.ac.uk, we can try and find out for you and answer that. And then the next question is, are the university rankings a source to consider before choosing which medical school to apply for? You can consider it. Um, I, I guess you need to understand what underpins those rankings and then decide whether how important those, those factors are to you. 
Um, I think it's personally, I think it's more important to work out whether this is the right place for you to study, to think about what the, the ethos of that medical school is like. So often if you can speak to students from that medical school or go to open days, we ran some virtual open days this year. You can um, speak to the staff, speak to the students, think about how the course is delivered and make a decision on that basis. The ranking, um, the rankings give very, uh, gives weightings to various sort of aspects. So often the grades that applicants or grades that students have achieved at A-level is one big factor. So um, medical schools like Oxford and Cambridge, because their students tend to have, you know, four A stars when they go to study medicine there, they tend to rank highly because, just because their students have got perhaps better A-level grades than, than say at Lancaster. Um, then there's other factors that are taken into account with various different weightings. So I think it's about thinking about what does that what does that ranking tell me about this medical school, and therefore, and and, and what am I interested in? What would make a difference to me about how I would choose my medical school? Those rankings re, like they don't make any difference in terms of what job you'll get at the end or your ability to kind of move into a specialty. So. I think it's about working out what that ranking tells you. One of the things that's in the rankings is the national student survey kind of responses, which will tell you about um, whether students in general are satisfied with their experience of studying at that medical school. So that might be something you want to look at because I guess that might give you some information about the student experience. I hope that answers your question, Toby. So next we have a question. How do you decide which college to apply to within a university? <laughs> Good question. So in Oxford and Cambridge, obviously you have to apply through the college. Um, and I, I really, I couldn't answer that. I don't know how you would make that decision. Lancaster is also a collegiate university, but you don't have to decide which college um, when you apply. You just apply to Lancaster University. At the point, if, if you're made an offer and if you're confirmed onto the course, you have to choose your accommodation. And by and part of the choosing your accommodation, you have the ability to express a preference for a college. Um, but I would say at Lancaster, it really doesn't matter what college you get into um, because it's more that the colleges have um, kind of they contribute to the experience you have in terms of giving you a smaller community within the larger university community which helps students to settle into university make an effective transition and kind of settle in well any other questions folks OK, so I think I've answered all the questions um, and so thank you very much for your attention this evening. I hope you found, uh, found the presentation helpful. If you want uh, to get access to the recording uh, and what I will do, I will send those links to the Medical Schools Council to Nicola and then she can send those back to anyone who contacts schools at lancaster.ac.uk uh, um, to get uh, an access to the recording. Thanks very much, folks.